So welcome to this second lecture on the topic of truth, logic and dialogue. In this lecture, I am going to focus on the inferential component of inquiry as described in the previous lecture, uh, and in particular, kind of idealised inference that involves multiple interlocutors or agents uh, jointly inquiry, inquiring. Uh, and in particular, I will propose how argumentative and dialectical formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning can provide a basis for the norms that prescribe this kind of distributed reasoning that multiple agents engage in when inquiring. And then in the true pragmatist spirit, I'll finish by focusing or, or suggesting some of the differences that these dialectical formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning as dialogue can make uh, to our, uh, our interactions with artificial intelligence. So just a quick recap on the truth norm that I, I uh, proposal that I developed yesterday. Recall this, the idea is that if some proposition P is doubted and establishing whether P yields utility, then these are prima facie grounds for inquiring so, estab so as to establish whether P. And remember, you know, not just any inquiry will do. I mean, we're not interested in specious methods of inquiry, but rather uh, individual and joint a dialogical inquiry governed by prescriptive norms of truthfulness, as well as norms constitutive of cognition, as I, as I, as I suggested when presenting the predictive processing model of, of cognition. And in this lecture, I'm going to suggest that these prescriptive norms of truthfulness can be grounded in, in non-monotonic formalisms for reasoning in the presence of uncertainty. That is, when engaging in joint dialogical inquiry, the prescriptive norms of truthfulness by which one should ideally abide by when inquiring jointly, when engaging in dialogue, can be essentially grounded in, in, in principles of non-monotonic reasoning and in particular non-monotonic logics. Now, of course, uh, the idea of formalizing logic as a dialogue uh, is not a new one. I mean, in some sense, uh, the early Socratic and Indian logic traditions primarily concerned themselves with dialectical or dynamic accounts of logic for practical epistemic reasoning. That is, logics for defeasible reasoning, for belief formation, for belief revision. But logic went, underwent a kind of mentalistic turn with the work of Descartes and Kant, who conceived of logic as constitutively normative for thought, or for the thought of individual reasoners. And this, together with the, um, with a, the, the logistic kind of approach to providing uh, logical foundations for mathematics in the early 20th century, this mentalistic conception and this kind of math, this um, uh, um, attempt to provide logical foundations for mathematics have essentially informed our modern understanding or modern approaches to logics. In particular, logics for AI have inherited both this mentalistic conception and the kind of correspondence intuitions, right? The idea that that thought, that our thoughts or, our, or, or assertions somehow correspond to facts in the world, well, this can be seen to equate with the distinction between proof theory and model theory in our modern understanding uh, and development of logic. Uh, recently, there has been work, in particular um, by uh, Katerina Novas, uh, who's uh, on advocating a renewal of this kind of dialectical conception of logic. Now, Novas focuses on dialect dialogical conceptions of monotonic or classical logics. But given uh, the pragmatic conception of truth that I articulated as a norm instigating inquiry, I argue that our task 
should be to provide a dialectical formula formulation of non-monotonic logics, complementary to these dialectical or dialogical formalizations of monotonic logics. In particular, as I suggested, uh, we should focus on norms of truthfulness governing the rules of engagement and inquiry and dialogue. Right? Norms, as it were, deployed in the service of the truth norm. Norms encoding dialectical or dialog dialogical characterizations of rational, non-monotonic, logic-based prescriptions for reasoning in the presence of uncertainty and conflict. And in particular, um, I'll be focusing on how these non-monotonic logic-based prescriptions for reasoning in a, with, with uncertainty and conflict can be formalized as dialogical norms constraining the contents and relations between speech acts so that when engaging in dialogue, interlocutors are subject to these dialectical norms that are prescriptive um, for the processes of a distributed non-monotonic reasoning. So just to give you an idea of what we're aiming at, basically we want to enable multiple agents, both human and artificial agents, to engage in dialogue in which they exchange locutions and we are aiming at the following kinds of soundness and completeness results. We want that some dialogue, GD, establishes a claim, beta, if and only if beta is non monotonically inferred from the contents, the contents of declarative locutions exchanged in the dialogue. So that's essentially what we're aiming at. Now, I'm calling this uh, a public semantics because the, 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 we're interested in a dialogue establishing a claim, if and only if that claim is inferred from what's been publicly articulated, what's publicly accessible. A more ambitious result would then also be to, to establish these soundness and completeness results with respect to a dialogue and the contents not just of what's been publicly exchanged during, in, in these locutions, but also the contents of the agent's individual belief basis. Okay, so I'm calling this, as it were, a private semantics. I'm, I'm putting semantics in quotation marks uh, for reasons I will, I, I will discuss later at the end of the lecture. So let's now look to how we can develop these dialogical formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning that enable joint inquiry amongst multiple interlocutors. So let me begin by describing how we can provide argumentative formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning. So the idea is that one has a belief base and one can apply deductive or strict inference rules as well as defeasible or default inference rules to our belief base in order to derive non-monotonic inferences. And so this is the sort of standard picture of, non, of, a, of a number of different non-monotonic logics including preferred sub-theories, prioritised default logic, writer's original default logic, etc, etc. One can also make use of preference information to arbitrate amongst conflicting non-monotonic inferences. So you recall in yesterday's example I talked about an individual inquirer who could infer both that their partner was at home and that their partner was not at home. In that particular example, upon further inquiry, consulting their calendar, they used the additional information that it was their partner's mother's birthday to arbitrate in favour of H, that their partner was at home, over, um, sorry, in, in favour of negation H, that's negation H, that their partner was not at home, in favour of 
the inference h that their partner was at home. One can also use preference information to arbitrate amongst these uh, conflicting non-monotonic inferences. So we have these non-monotonic logics and we can provide argumentative formalization of formalizations of these non-monotonic logics in the following way. From the belief base and using these inference rules, we can construct arguments. Okay, so for example, one might have an argument X that says, well, from the premise A, the default rule that A defeasibly implies B, and the material implication that B implies C, we conclude C. So we have an argument for C. This argument challenges or defeats the argument Y because C, the conclusion of X, negates the premise negation C of Y. Now this challenge by X on Y succeeds as a defeat because the argument Y is not stronger, not preferred to the argument X. Now in in work with Henry Pracken that we've developed the aspect plus framework that provides logic based prescriptions on how one defines given a belief base, given strict and defeasible inference rules, how one defines the contents of arguments when one argument is said to legitimately challenge or attack another and the kinds of preferences one can use over arguments. The idea is that we provide logic based prescriptions such that when we evaluate the arguments, this yields rational outcomes. Now, I talked about evaluating the arguments because, of course, when we construct these arguments and these defeat relations amongst these arguments, we essentially end up with an argument graph, right? So nodes are arguments, and the relations between these nodes are ones of defeat or challenge. Then, applying Dung's calculus of opposition, the seminal work of Dung um, in which arguments in a framework related by uh, challenge, uh, by attacks or defeats can be evaluated so as to, ter to determine the winning arguments. Essentially, in Dung's work, the idea is that one, given an argument graph of arguments and, and, and relations, between, relations of challenge between them, one can one establishes winning sets or justified sets of arguments. These are called extensions, and arguments in these extensions are required not to challenge each other, so they have to be conflict-free. No two arguments in an extension defeats one another, and the arguments in these extensions um, are defendable. They can defend themselves against defeats, and I'll, I'll explain this in the coming slides. But essentially the idea is that one can establish the winning or justified arguments and then one can show these kinds of soundness and completeness results. That alpha is the claim of a winning argument if and only if alpha can be non-monotonically inferred from the underlying belief base. So essentially we have these argumentative formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning. So let's give a simple example. Supposing we, supposing we have a, a belief base consisting of uh, a logic program, then we can construct an argument Z that says from the premise M and the rule M implies G, we can construct an argument for G. So that's the argument Z. We can also construct an argument Y that says, well, look, given the rule not G implies S, I can conclude S. So, of course, what this rule expresses is that if G is not provable, then conclude S. Then Z is an argument that attacks Y because Z establishes the claim G. That is, Z establishes what Y assumed was not provable. So Z attacks or, or defeats or challenges Y. I'm going to use these terms synonymously. Now we can also construct an argument X that says from J, from the rule J implies P, uh, and then from the rule that P and not S, so P and S not provably conclude Q, 
we can, we can derive Q. Of course, Y is an argument that, that defeats X because Y claims what X assumes is not provable, i.e. S. Then one can define a conflict-free set of arguments, so in particular X and Z are, do not defeat each other, so they belong to a conflict-free set of arguments. And moreover, Z is not defeated, so it, 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 there's no need to defend Z against any, any defeat. X is defeated by Y, but Z, def Z defends X by defeating the defeater of X, i.e. Z defeats Y. So X is defended by the argument Z. One then has soundness and completeness results with respect to the logic programming inferences over a belief base. So if one had just applied a standard logic programming theorem prover, one would establish that G and Q follow from this logic program. S does not follow. And indeed, G and Q are the claims of the winning arguments X and Z. Let's give another example uh, of prioritized default logic as argumentation. So this is our, our hackneyed and standard uh, flying or not flying penguin example uh, involving our feathered friend Tweety. So we have these two default rules, uh, R1 and R2. If X is a penguin, then X typically or defeasibly does not fly. If X is a bird, then by default, or defeasibly, one conclude, can conclude that X flies. We have that penguins are a subclass of birds, as expressed by the material implication P of X implies B of X. And we have the fact that PT is a, Tweety is a penguin. And we have some priority, pri priority information about the rules. In particular, that R1 is prioritized above R2, is a stronger rule. Why? Because... Rules expressing properties of subclasses take priority over rules expressing properties of superclasses. So penguins are a subclass of birds, as expressed by this material implication. And so the rule R1 that expresses a property of the subclass penguin takes priority over rule R2 that expresses a property of superclass birds. OK, so we can construct the arguments X, Y, Z, where X is an argument saying, well, given Tweety is a penguin, penguins are birds. And given the rule R2, one can conclude that Tweety flies. We also have an argument Y, which says given Tweety is a penguin and the rule R1 expressing that penguins typically don't fly, we can construct an argument that Tweety does not fly. And then we have a third argument, Z, that simply expresses that, well, given Tweety is a, a penguin and penguins are a subclass of birds, conclude that, 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 uh, that Tweety is a bird. Now, let's look at the, the extensions of arguments. We have two extensions. Both are conflict-free. Z does not defeat what X and, and vice versa. And Y does not defeat Z and vice versa. Now, X defeats Y because X makes a claim fly Tweety that negates the conclusion of Y. Similarly, Y defeats X because their conclusions uh, are in conflict. And X and Y defend each other. Okay, so Y defeats X, but X defends itself by defeating Y back. Similarly, X defeats Y, but Y defends itself by defeating X back. So we have two preferred extensions. Okay, they're both conflict-free. Both their contained arguments defend themselves successfully against defeats. And then we can see that the claims of the justified arguments, okay, in one extension, X uh, claims flight Tweety flies. In the other extension, Y claiming Tweety does not fly. These equate with the credulous default logic inferences. Okay, so credulous inference essentially is the idea that, look, we have a number of possibly conflicting non monotonic inference. Let's be credulous and just, just accept that we have these conflicting uh, non monotonic or contradictory non monotonic inference. Tweety flies and Tweety does not fly. 
Now, under the grounded criteria for establishing whether um, a set of arguments is justified, arguments cannot defend themselves against defeat. Okay, so, so in this case, um, in the, under the grounded criteria, we only have one extension containing the undefeated argument Z, which claims that, tw that Tweety is a bird. Okay, we, we, we cannot include X or Y in the grounded extension because uh, we in, 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 in both cases, uh, X defends itself against Y's defeat on X, and similarly Y defends itself against X's, X's defeat on Y. And once again, we can say, we can see that we have uh, the claim that, that uh, Tweety is a bird, uh, is, uh, is, which is the claim of the only justified argument Z, and this equates with the, the only sceptical inference of uh, in prioritized default logic from this uh, belief base, which is essentially that Tweety is a bird. Okay, so I've given you a couple of examples of uh, just kind of intuitions about how we can develop argumentative formalizations of non monotonic inference. Now, of course, we also have the, the preference information that y, the argument y, is stronger than the argument x. Okay, this is because y makes use of rule R1 that is prioritized above the rule R2, R2 that, is made of, um, uh, that is made use of in the argument x. So given that y is stronger than x, one can say that, well, look, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the attack from x to y does not succeed as a defeat, right? That Y, as it were, successfully resists the challenge from X. And so we can remove this attack, which now does not succeed as a defeat, and we are left only with the defeat from Y to X. And so now we only have a single set uh, or a single extension of justified arguments, both under the grounded and preferred criteria. The argument Z and the argument Y. And so you making use of this preference information, we can now both skeptically and credulously draw the inferences not only that Tweety is a bird, but that Tweety does not fly. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but where, where does this preference information come from? I mean, surely we might have reasons for why one prefers one rule or one argument over another. And indeed, it may be that if I'm engaged in a dialogue, um, that I might have some legitimate reason or argument for why X is stronger than Y, okay, or preferred to Y, whereas my interlocutor might have a legitimate reason or argument for why Y, y is stronger than X, i.e. a contradictory preference. So the idea would be that really what we want especially when it comes to dialogue settings where interlocutors might disagree on preferences, is that we want to be able to reason about preferences. We want, want to be able to, to say, to give arguments for why one argument is preferred to another and then arbitrate amongst conflicting preferences. And so in work uh, I developed some time ago on extended, extended, extending the standard Dung framework, um, I uh, propose that we, we additionally allow arguments that can claim preferences for other arguments. And these arguments claiming preferences don't attack or challenge other arguments, but they attack the attacks between other arguments. So let's take an example just to give you intu in intuition. Supposing we have an argument A, which says, look, it will, today will be hot in London since the BBC forecast sunshine. Supposing we other have a contradictory or conflicting argument B, claiming it will be cool because of CNN, because CNN forecasts rain. So these two arguments attack each other. Right? A attacks B, B attacks A. But then, supposing I can also have an argument C that says, well, look, because the BBC are more trustworthy than CNN, A is stronger than B. 
Now recall that when we have such a preference, A stronger than B, then this essentially cancels out an attack from uh, B to A, because A successfully resists the challenge from uh, from B to A. So we can accommodate this kind of idea by including in the argument framework uh, the argument C that attacks the attack from B to A. So C is winning. C successfully knocks out the attack from B to A. We are just left with the attack from A to B, which therefore succeeds as a defeat. And we have that A is winning and B is losing. Of course, an inter interlocutor might say, well, look, statistics show that C and N are more accurate than BBC. And this justifies um, the claim that B is stronger than A. So C and D now claim contradictory preferences and so attack each other. So now we have our dilemma with respect to the preference information. We cannot use either of these preference arguments to successfully knock out the attacks from A to B and vice versa. And we now are back in our original situation where we have two preferred extensions, uh, one containing an argument for A, the other for, for B. Right? And we have credulous inferences. Uh, we basically are, are undecided as to whether we should um, uh, be in favour of the claim that it would be hot or cool. Of course, we can go to the meta, as it were, meta-meta level and argue about why one criterion is preferred or, or, or stronger than another, than another. So we can construct an argument E which says, well, because statistics is a more rational criterion than trustworthiness, the argument D is stronger than the argument C. Right? So similarly, E now attacks the attack from C to D because E essentially justifies why D's preference right, has more, is more legitimate or is stronger, has more, has more legitimate grounds than C's preference. So E def knocks out the attack from uh, C to D. So D successfully defeats C. And so C's attack on B's attack to A is, 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 is knocked out. Okay? And so now we only have that the winning argument D knocks out the attack from A to B. And so B ends up being the winning argument. Okay? So this was just pointing to some work on extending argument frameworks to accommodate argumentation, reason, argumentation based reasoning about preferences. Indeed, the work has also been used uh, to kind of uh, enable argumentation-based reasoning about values because in a number of works uh, which look at argumentation for practical reasoning, it's values and value orderings that determine uh, which argument is preferred to another. And so in these kinds of approaches, when one is reasoning about action, one would also want to, for example, reason and argue about uh, value orderings, about why one value uh, takes precedence over another value. And we can actually accommodate reasoning about, about, about values in, in these argumentation frameworks. Okay. Now, I want to turn to argument game proof theories for non-monotonic inference. So let's just take a step back, remind ourselves that the idea is we have a static belief base from which we construct an argument framework, okay, and we, can, we then evaluate the extensions, the winning sets of arguments, and thereby the claims of justified arguments that equate with the non-monotonic inferences from the underlying belief base, from the belief base from which the argument framework was constructed. Now, one can then make use of argument game proof theories. So given an argument framework, one can ask, for example, the following question. Is D in a preferred extension? Now, we're looking at the figure on the left-hand side, we indeed see that there are two preferred extensions. One containing A, one containing B, they defend themselves against each other. D is in both extensions because although D is defeated by C, a 
defends D against C and B defends C against D. Okay? So, so we can we can deploy an argument game in which um, when he has, let's say, a, a, think of a, 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 a proponent or an imaginary proponent in the case of single agent reasoning, starts by, by, by saying, is D in a preferred extension? And then proponent and opponent reference the argument framework and make moves. So C, opponent will then move C, given C, C defeats D, and so on and so forth. Now, I won't go into the details of, of, of the termination rules for these games, but in this particular case, Pro has won the game, uh, demonstrating that D is indeed in a preferred extension. Okay, At this point, at, after Pro moves A, the second instance of A, Op cannot repeat B. Okay, under the rules of the preferred game. In the grounded game, however, uh, opponent has the last word in both both uh, lines of dispute in this in this in this argument game, and so pro loses the game. D is not justified under the grounded semantics. Okay, intuitively, of course, this is because there is no extension containing D uh, and uh, either A or B because. In the ground, under the grounded criteria, arguments cannot defend themselves against defeat. And in this case, A and B both defend themselves against defeat. Now, one can generalize these argument games to dialogical accounts of non-monotonic reasoning. So the idea is that we have interlocutors ex exchanging locutions and when they exchange locutions, the, 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 the putting forward of a locution essentially results in the, the, the interlocutor being subject to, dia, to dialectical obligations. Okay, So in these dialogue games, for example, an agent one can assert Q. This is a speech act, uh, uh, for those familiar with speech act theory, basically... Uh, speech acts often come with kind of obligations as to how one should respond to these speech acts. So an agent one asserts Q. Okay. Now, the idea is, is instead of, of course, proponent and opponent, we have now agent one and agent two. And rather than the kind of zero sum sort of proponent opponent uh, characterization of a game, we have agents actually combining their their resource to jointly inquire okay so this is this is how we go this is a sort of a generalization of di of argument games but but it, it but one that accommodates uh joint inquiry rather than a kind of persuasive element as we've seen in the, in, in in the argument games so agent one asserts q at this point in the game in in the dialogue the, 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 the dialectical status of the locution, assert Q, is winning because there is no locution that has been moved by any agent to kind of challenge this assertion. Now, an agent, as I said, asserts Q. One can then update a commitment store which incrementally tracks the declarative contents of locutions. Okay, so an assertion is a declarative locution. It declaratively asserts that Q is the case. And the commitments then are updated to include this, this, this assertion, that the declarative content, Q. And of course, we can see from Delta, the, the, the commitment store, that alpha is not, that in this case, Q or alpha is non-monotonically inferred from, from, from Delta. And so we have this soundness and complete result between the dialectical status of the loc locution assert alpha, in this case alpha being Q, and alpha or Q being non-monotonically inferred from delta. Okay, but then agent 2 asks why Q? So when agent 1 has asserted Q, they are under the dialectical obligation to respond to any challenge in order to to be said to have established Q. So once agent 2 questions this assertion with YQ, um, 
Q is no longer uh, established within this graph of locutions. Essentially, one can see YQ as an attack, right, on a cert Q. So instead of arguments attacking other arguments, as in argument games, we have an, a locution attacking another locution. And since Y has not been responded to, since Agent 1 has not fulfilled the dialectical obligation to provide some reasons as to why Q, Y is a winning locution, Y challenges uh, the assert locution, so the assert locution is losing, and so we have that the dialogue graph does not establish Q, and because the assertion of Q is under challenge, we remove Q from the commitment store, and we see that Q is indeed not a non-homotonic inference from the commitment store delta. Of course, agent one might then provide an argument for Q. Essentially that given the facts P and S, and that S, P defeasibly entail Q, then this is an argument for Q. So agent one has now fulfilled its dialectical obligation. The argument X is not challenged, so it's winning. Having fulfilled its dialectical obligation um, in response to the, to, to, to the query YQ, the, the, the locution YQ is now losing. And so uh, the locution assert Q is winning. So again, you see, we, we see this, this, um, this defense, as it were, this kind of no principle of, of defending oneself, defending one's arguments. But the def defense is not applied to arguments but to locutions. And then a commitment store is now updated to include the facts P, S, and the rule if S and P then defeasibly include Q. And indeed, Q is a non-monotonic inference from delta, equating with the dialectical status of a cert Q being winning. Of course, agent two might then counter-argue X with Y, an argument claiming Negation S, which challenges the premise S in the argument X. Again, we see the dialectical status of, of, of the locution argue Y being winning as it's unchallenged. Therefore, argument X is losing. Uh, the locution Y Q is winning. And so the assertion Q is now losing. OK. Looking at the commitment store. We have the contents of both arguments y and x. y defeats x. Uh, and indeed, um, q is no longer a non montonic inference from delta, equating with the assertion q not having, um, uh, uh, being, having, having a, being evaluated as, as, having, as being losing. OK. Agent 1, of course, can backtrack to an earlier locution. So... Having lost, as it were, the argument with X as providing a, a, a justifiable reason for the assertion Q, agent one backtracks to respond to locution YQ with an alternative argument for Q, which says basically given M, and M implies defeasibly entails Q, uh, this provides a, a rationale or a justification for Q. The, 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 the uh, commitment store delta is updated and we have indeed that Q is a non montonic inference from delta equating with the dialectical status of a cert Q being winning. Of course, remember, as I, as I emphasized earlier, we're not, in the, we're not in the game of, as it were, persuasion, where, for example, uh, what one might expect an interlocutor to deploy any means uh, possible, including being deceptive or using rhetoric to persuade another interlocutor. Right. We're interested in joint inquiry, combining the epistemic resources of agents in joint inquiry. Uh, and as I described, you know, discussed in, in yesterday's lecture, this um, this is, of course, an important way of of, of sharing, of, of establishing a shared understanding of the world and thereby the instrumental utility that accrues uh, in terms of uh, collaborative actions to address um to, to address our practical aims. So in this case now, agent one, when moving the argument Z, does not have the fact M. 
it says, well, look, I have a rule that says from M defeasibly entail Q, but I, I, don't, I don't know Q. Can anybody help me? Um, I don't have any, any reason to support uh, the fact that, that M is the case or any argument for M. Okay. Now, notice, of course, that in this case, the declarative contents of what's been exchanged in the locutions thus far does not include M. M is, M is as it were, um, uh, being questioned, being, be, you know, uh, un where there's some uncertainty about M. And of course, Q now is no longer a non-monotonic inference from delta. This also equates with, with the dialectical status of a cert Q. Um, actually, that should be losing rather than winning, being losing. Because the argument Z, the dialectical status of the argument Z is not winning because a premise is, it, there's no premise available. Um, M is not, uh, is not available for constructing a complete argument. Agent 3, maybe Agent 3 could be, for example, uh, a, a, an AI system, provides the information that M, and now assert M, and in asserting M, this locution, rather than challenging uh, the locution argues it supports the locution by providing um, by providing a response to the query M. Okay, so now assert M is winning; it's not challenged. Argue Z that locution is winning because in query its query uh, for M has been appropriately responded to, and now Y Q is out. Assert Q is 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 winning, and indeed. Uh, we have the dialectical status of, of a cert Q is winning if and only if, and then Q is a non monotonic inference from delta. And so on. We, have, uh, we, we, we can explore other kinds of locutions. So, for example, um, the locution that, that claims that one argument is preferred to another. Uh, a locution claiming, well, why is it the case that one ar this argument is preferred to another, and so on and so forth. We can argue about preferences. One can retract uh, assertions previously made in a dialogue or concede uh, if one wants to explicitly acknowledge what that one accepts a particular claim, and so on and so forth. And so not all the soundness and completeness results have been established for these more... Uh, more fully communicative, account communicative accounts of distributed non monotonic reasoning, but this is the direction in which uh, we're going. One can also um, look at some other uh, work on, on soundness and completeness results that accommodate enthymemes. So the basic idea here is that, look, in, in real-world communicative interactions, we don't exchange fully formed arguments, okay? It's often the case that we might make an assertion or, or, or query something, assuming that our interlocutors are able to sort of, as it were, fill in the gaps. You know, we have theories of other people's minds. We have some expectations about what their beliefs are, right? Uh, and so it may be that I might assert, make an assertion, you know, Q, uh, expecting that you would be, you would be able to sort of fill in uh, an argument for YQ, or I might, uh, for example, uh, in this particular case, uh, let's say we have an, uh, an interlocutor, Bob, who, who argues the following, look, you can't afford to eat at a restaurant today. Okay, then Alice asks why. Bob says, well, because you owe money. So in this particular case, um, Bob is anticipating that Alice would 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 given that given M defeasibly infer you know negation E. Bob doesn't explicitly flesh out the argument. Bob doesn't say, well, because you you owe money, because you owe money, and if you owe money, then you can't afford to eat at the restaurant. It's not a fully fleshed argument. Okay? Now of course this can lead to understanding, misunderstandings, because Alice might say, well, look, I made a deal with my creditor, my creditors. Now, in this case, Alice is implicitly moving an argument that says, well, given C, I've made a deal with my creditors, then this defeasibly entails negation M. Okay, 
But Bob, Bob does not have this argument in mind. Bob does not see this as a reason for why Alice owes money. So Bob says, well, so what? So what if you made a deal with your creditors? And Alice replies, well, so I don't... Now Alice fleshes out the argument. Well, C implies negation M. I don't, I don't owe money. Okay. <clears throat> and then Bob says, well, no. I meant you owe money because you need to pay Kate today. Okay. So Bob's argument, what well, the argument Bob had in mind was that K defeasibly entails M. And that's why uh, Alice cannot afford to eat at the restaurant today. Okay. So in work with, 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 with others, we've been exploring how we can make use of these locution, locutions to effectively... Uh, flesh out, as it were, the arguments into fully fledged arguments so that we can establish these uh, soundness and completeness results. So this is work towards more fully commun so more comprehensive accounts of communicative uh, distributed reasoning. So where we are, Going back to my uh, earlier kind of aspirations for, for these public and private uh, semantics, uh, we have a number of results which can establish that the dialectical status of a locution assert Q, for example, is winning if and only if the declarative contents of the publicly accessible locutions non-monotonically entails uh, the, assert, the, the, the claim, in this case Q, under, the, uh, under a number of given a number of conditions. Firstly, that the agents comply with these dialectical norms, which are encoded in a protocol that guides the interlocutors in their dialogue, and that the interlocutors are exhaustive with respect to um, the contents of what's been publicly uh, um, um, exchanged in the, during the course of the dialogue. By, by which I mean... If, given the information exchanged in the dialogue, the agents can make use of that information to put forward another locution, they do so. So this was a public semantics case I referred to earlier. In the case of the, pri in the private semantics case, where we are interested in a dialogue establishing a claim, if and only if that claim is non-monotonically inferred, not only from the contents of what's been publicly communicated, but also the contents of their individual belief bases, we need some additional uh, uh, conditions on sound, uh, to, in to ensure soundness and completeness. In particular, not only that they fully comply with their dialectical norms and are exhaustive, but also that they are exhaustive with respect to their own private beliefs. So if, on the basis of what's been communicated during the course of the dialogue, and the contents of their private belief, belief bases, they can, given the constraints imposed by the protocol, make a locution, then they make that locution. So they're exhaustive in that sense. Exhaustive with respect also to the contents of their private beliefs. And of course, if they're honest, under these conditions, one can establish these kinds of soundness and completeness results uh, for the private semantics case. Okay. I'm now also finally, uh, as I come towards the end of this this presentation, briefly going to mention some work some work I've been undertaking with uh, Marcello D'Agostino. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Aspic Plus framework, which I've which I've been working with uh, working on with with Henry Pracken, uh, establishes. Uh, conditions for construction of arguments, for defining attacks between arguments and conditions on preference relations, such that the outcome of argument evaluation, that is, working out what the justified arguments are, yields rational outcomes. For example, that when, when expecting the contents of arguments in any given extension, the contents of these arguments are mutually consistent. So this would be uh, an ideal, a, a, a rational ideal. However, uh, Aspic Plus and many other approaches 
uh, can only show these rational under outcomes under the assumptions uh, under the assumption that agents are omniscient. That is, they have unlimited cognitive or computational resources. In recent work with Marcello D'Agostino, we've developed a dialectical generalization of Aspect Plus that establishes relatively undemanding lower bounds on the agent's resources such that we can guarantee rational outcomes. Right? And of course, because Aspect Plus provides argumentative formalizations of, non of a number of non monotonic logics, including preferred sub-theories and prioritized default logic, we thereby obtain um, rational formalizations of non monotonic log logics under resource bounds. So rational rationality under resource bounds for non monotonic logics. Also, in this work with Marcello, we extend the range of kind of dialectical moves okay, that can be made in the course of a dialogue. So in particular, we distinguish um, premises that an argument uses uh, according to those that an interlocutor commits to and those that an interlocutor cites as being committed to by someone else. Right? So, for example, Given I can I can an argument can be of the following form. Given that I commit to F and F defeasibly entails negation C, and supposing for the sake of your of argument your commitment to negation C implies G, it follows that G. Right? So in this argument here, I have a committed sub-argument A and a supposed argument B. Now, one of the advantages of this kind of distinction is that it allows us to formalize the kinds of dialectical move uh, one, one, one often witnesses in dialogue, in particular a kind of Socratic move where one by, whereby one demonstrates that an interlocutor has, has contradicted themselves. Right? So one can say, well, given no commitments of mine and supposing for the sake of arguments your commitment to such and such, it follows that falsehood, it follows you've, you, you, you've contradicted yourself. So in this example here on the slide, we have an argument X that says, well, empty set, given no commitments to mine, and supposing for the sake of argument the commitments you've made to P, P implies negation Q and Q, it follows that falsum. So in this scenario, one can imagine an agent during the course of a dialogue having committed to A, arguments A, E and F. So we can imagine inter interlocutor committing to these, having put forward these arguments. I can then say, well, look, I can move an argument X that says, well, given your commitments, you've contradicted yourself. Now notice that the argument X cannot itself be defeated on it because I've not made any commitments, right? I've not committed to anything, so I can't be challenged. So X can never be, as it were, defended Okay, the, the, the defeats by X on A, E and F can never be defended by an argument because, no, because, because X makes no commitments. X cannot be targeted by any argument. Okay, so that's just pointing to ongoing work uh, with Marcello uh, D'Agostino. Um, now, clearly... There are many more uh, research challenges to address if we are really going to realise fully communicative, communicative accounts of distributed non-monotonic reasoning. But um, what I'd like to actually do now is very briefly return to the previous lecture uh, in which we developed this idea of inquiry board, broadly construed, uh, inquiry instigated by the truth norm. And I think a more ambitious long-term aim might be to um, formalise this notion of inquiry in the broad sense as dialogue grounded in, in non-monotonic reasoning. So we've looked at uh, the kind of inferential component of inquiry as constituted by interlocutors engaging in distributed reasoning, and a limiting, a limiting case of which is um, individual agent inference, 
a further aim would be to include in this non-monotonic account or this, this account of dialogue grounded in non-monotonic reasoning to, to develop this account of inquiry that accommodates the ongoing dynamics of perceptual and active inference as proposed in this predictive processing model of, of cognition. As well as um, cognition, or this kind of predictive processing model of cognition, um, the idea would be to develop this account of non-monotonic reasoning that includes the confirming and revising of our default models of the world in response to the success or failure of expected outcomes of actions as revealed by perception. So if you recall uh, in, this, in, the, in the account of the individual inquiring that when tipping uh, a glass to their lips, the failure of the expected outcome, that is the tactile, tactile sensation of water on their lips, leads to a, a, a revision of the, of, the, of the preconditions for the success of that action. Okay, so one of the preconditions for the successful experiential outcome of the action, i.e. the tactile sensation, one of the preconditions was that there was water in the glass. So the failure of that experiential prediction, i.e. the outcome of the action, serves to revive, further undermine our confidence, or as it were, revise our, our initial hypothesis that there was water in the glass. Now, developing this broader account of inquiry as dialogue that accommodates the predictive processing model of cognition, the, the success of expected outcomes, will require integration of statistical inference or subjective probabilities with these argumentative formalizations of non-monotonic reasoning. So we have the essentially uh, a Bayesian uh, 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 account of predictive processing. So recall yesterday, I briefly mentioned that predictive processing essentially approximates Bayesian inference uh, using uh, minimization of prediction error. So the idea, of course, in Bayesian inference that one wants to establish the, 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 the probability of a hypothesis that the environment is as it is uh, given the data and this is equal to the, the probability of the data given the hypo our hypothesis about the environment times the prior probability of the hypothesis, of the hypothesis, actually divided by the, 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 the probability of the data. But that's there just for, uh, uh, to normalize. One also would want to integrate the statistical inference of machine learning AIs into this non-monotonic non a formalization of dialogue uh, as, as inquiry broadly construed. So now in the last two or three minutes, uh, I want to point to some of the differences that this dialogical uh, conception of, of logic, um, a conception of logic motivated by an account of truth that I developed in the previous lecture, I want to point to some of the differences that this dialo dialogical conception of logic uh, can make. In particular, as discussed in the previous lecture, um, as individuals we are subject to a confirmation bias, and these confirmation biases in our reasoning can be accounted for by these evolutionary accounts of the origins of reasoning. Now, we can see the use of filtering algorithms on social media as amplifying this confirmation bias, right? By providing us with more and more information that confirms uh, our beliefs, in particular our kind of tribal beliefs, beliefs relating to political, social and cultural issues. And this, of course, has led to polarization and entrenchment of, of beliefs. Now, I suggest that perhaps we can stem the tide of polarization and entrenchment through the use of formal models of rational joint inquiry and dialogue that could be deployed by AI systems 
to inculcate and reward critical reasoning and constructive disagreement by deploying these AI systems in education. So one could imagine a, a Socratic AI sort of scaffolding dialogue and constructive disagreement amongst children or teenagers in early education. Right? So one could imagine um, these kind of critical reasoning and uh, skills being developed and being supported and being scaffolded by the use of, of this kind of a Socratic AI type system in, in education. One could envisage a Socratic search or argumentation engine engaging politics or philosophy students um, so as to kind of uh, remind them of, of possible counter-arguments to their own position, uh, engaging them in these kinds of dialectical exchange and so inculcating skills, critical reasoning skills. And one could look towards large language models uh, as computational interlocutors that mine the web for arguments and engage human interlocutors in dialogue. Indeed, uh, I'm currently working with a PhD student on, on, on training large language models to engage in this kind of dialogical interaction. So as well as using these formal models of dialogue for inculcating critical reasoning and dialectical skills uh, amongst humans, I'm also going to suggest the use of these formal models of dialogue for addressing, helping to address the value alignment problem. So this is a problem um, that uh, is, is very much uppermost, I guess, in the minds of, of researchers working in AI uh, um, and, and more generally. Um, and it's the problem of of how to ensure that as AI systems become more and more powerful and more and more autonomous, how can we ensure that the ways in which they uh, realise their goals um, are aligned with human values and don't, don't, as it were, go against human values? And uh, Stuart Russell, the, 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 the writer of the book on AI, um, has proposed uh, a solution to this problem called cooperative inverse reinforcement learning. And essentially the idea is that uh, the, 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 the core goal of any AI system should be to uh, learn the values uh, of humans while at the same time simultaneously acting or performing tasks on behalf of humans. And the idea is that these AI systems can acquire an understanding of human values through observation of human behaviours, where these behaviours um, reveal our preferences and values, and be instructed by humans, explicitly be instructed by humans, uh, so as to acquire a more sophisticated understanding of, of, of human values and preferences. I'm also going to suggest that this kind of uh, acquisition of values by AI systems will require uh, dialogical interactions with humans. So just as the, just in the same way that that children, as they grow up, acquire an understanding of human values through observation of role models, through instruction from adults, so we would expect a more refined, more sophisticated acquisition of values to proceed via the use of argument, discussion, and debate. Uh, so. I'm proposing these formal models of, of dialogue to support this enculturation of AI uh, and that, so, so as to thereby uh, um, inculcate, through enculturation, an understanding of human values and preferences. And then, you know, perhaps a more speculative proposal uh, is, is to point to the philosopher Robert Brandom's notion of semantic inferentialism as providing an account of how language and thought represent and acquire meaning. So rather than this, uh, the kind of, as it were, default idea that language and thought represent the world, acquire meaning by, by as it were, mapping to, to kind of things or facts in the world, the idea is that language and thought 
acquire, acquire their representational capacities, acquire meaning by virtue of the inferential role our beliefs or, or assertions play in perception, in action, in inference, in, 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 in our social practices, including communicative practices of dialogue. And so that's kind of more speculative idea, but I, I, I do have the sense that, that these kind of dialogical, that dialogue, dialogue with each other, dialogue with the world through perception and action uh, can, can help to kind of give an, provide, shed light on how language and thought acquire rep, their representational capacities and meaning. Well, that's all, folks. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you again.